the King. Rise among us, let her rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us, let her rise. preparation day the chief priests and pharisees went to pilate and they said sir we remember that while he was still alive that deceiver said after three days i will rise again so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead this last deception will be worse than the first take a guard pilate answered go make the tomb as secure as you know how so they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. <laughs> Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. We are in the Easter season. 
This is post-resurrection. Jesus has risen from the dead. He is alive. And that's what we've been talking about. Starting last week, we started this conversation on talking about the fact that Jesus is alive. Following his resurrection, Jesus spends a little bit of time running around, doing what he does. And so we're talking about the fact that he is risen. See, I tricked you by reading the one in the passage, I know. But this is where we live. We, we live in an Easter world. We celebrate the resurrection right now. This is the Easter season and we'll run up until Pentecost. But we live in an Easter world where Jesus is risen. We celebrate the fact that our Lord and Savior is alive. That death could not hold him. The tomb could not hold him. The devil could not keep him down. But Jesus is risen. Yeah, the wordy was a little different there. Sorry. I had to pause because I knew you guys were going to say something, uh, and that's good. But this is what we celebrate. And so this morning, as we worship together, we celebrate our risen Lord. Amen? One announcement to make this morning, just one. Uh, we are into the spring season. I want to thank uh, Marge for bringing flowers this morning. Uh, we can use flowers for the altar each week. If you've got a great abundance in your yard or coming in your yard and you'd like to help us out, uh, we have a sign-up sheet. I hope it's, is it still there? Yeah, we have a where the name tags are on the table out there. We'd invite you to sign up for a week, help us out, uh, dress up the altar for spring. With that, I would like to invite you to stand this morning. Let's get ready to begin our worship celebration. Will you join me as we confess our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as we have declared our faith this morning, let us then praise our Lord and Savior by lifting our voices in song this morning.
never gonna let me down. No, I'm never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. seated. When Jesus gathered with his disciples before his crucifixion and death on the cross, he gathered with them together and they shared the Passover meal. And in that moment, Jesus instituted something that was new and something that was special. It was no longer just the commemoration, the remembrance of God as he led Israel out of Egypt with Moses. It was no longer just remembering that great act that God did for this this nation of people who had struggled so much through their history. But in that moment, Jesus took Passover to a whole new level. As he was gathered with his disciples and he took the bread and he took the cup and he celebrated with them the sacrifice that was coming the one that would be once for all time. That they would receive, because of their faith in him, they would receive not only forgiveness for their sins, but the hope of eternal life in heaven. As Jesus goes to the cross and his body is nailed to the cross, his blood is shed, Jesus forgives us for our sins. And so we come to the table this morning remembering the sacrifice that he made for us remembering his sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. We come also receiving his true presence because at that meal, Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. I am present with you. I come to this place to meet with you as you eat and drink this morning. Christ is here meeting with you, reaching to you, touching your life. We also come make a declaration of our faith. As we eat and we drink, we declare the gospel message that we believe in Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and after he had blessed it, he gave it to them to drink, saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As we get ready to come to the table this morning, what I want to invite you to do is take just a few moments to reflect on your life. As you remain seated in the chairs there for the next few moments, just reflect on how you have turned your back on God, how you have walked walked away from God. Offer up your prayers of repentance and receive from him forgiveness 
for your sins this morning as you come to the table and you eat and you drink, not only in remembrance, but you eat and you drink forgiveness to yourself. I would invite the worship team to come down and join us first. Uh, Following that, we'll be inviting families with children who are going to go to CC Kids to come on down. uh, And then from there, we will continue our normal routine. So this morning, come. The Lord's table is ready. And that by which you have received the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to everlasting life. Amen. This time we get the opportunity to come before God, lift up our prayers and our petitions. Every week, Jenny hands me a list of people that our prayer team has been praying for all week long. Every time you let Jenny know or me know or Marge know or somebody know that there is a prayer request or a prayer need in your family, in your life, in the lives of the people that you know, maybe it's just someone that you met on the street who needed some prayer. Every time you give those to us, we pray for those. And we continue to pray for those, actually, until you let us know that that prayer is no longer needed. And so we invite you to let us know. You know, contact me, contact Ginny. Contact Marge. Let us know you have a prayer request. Go online, ccridgefield.com. There is a prayer card on there. You find it in the church app too. You can fill that out. That'll come to us. Sunday mornings, if you have a prayer request, write it on the wire rack just outside the doors. Before you come in here, you can write it on a card, put it up there. We'll pray for that. We'll continue to do so. So will you join me this morning as we lift up our prayers and our petitions before God. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come this morning and we give thanks. We give thanks, Lord, for your death on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you took that cross in our place. We also give thanks, Lord, for your resurrection. We have the hope of eternal life because of your victory over the grave. We come giving thanks this morning, Lord, that you have given us a church family. You have given us a group of people to gather together with, a place to worship that we can lift up our voices in praise to you. That we can come and we can pray together, that we can hear your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the freedom to worship where we are. And I pray, Lord, that we would value that as we recognize that in many places around the world, Lord, that freedom doesn't exist. And we pray for your church in those places as it continues to grow, oftentimes underground, oftentimes with persecution, oftentimes leading to death. And yet your church continues to move. It continues to grow. It continues to exist. Lord, we give thanks that you call us to worship wherever we are. We come this morning, Lord, lifting up prayers for our nation. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are in leadership over us. We pray for your hand of leadership and guidance upon them. We pray, Lord, for our communities. We pray for all of those who put their lives on the line, for all of our soldiers serving at home or abroad, Lord. We pray for our police officers. We pray for our firefighters. Pray for our emergency medical people who often rush into situations, see some of the toughest moments in human life or death. We pray for their mental well-being. We pray for their protection. We pray, Lord, for our schools. We give thanks, Lord, as students continue to go back to school in, uh, on more and more days, Lord. Yet we also pray for, our, for the teaching staff and for all of those who work in the schools, Lord. We pray for your hand upon them. Continue to give them strength in these last weeks of the school season. We pray for all of our students who have had to navigate school like they have never experienced before. We pray for your hand upon our graduating seniors, Lord, who had a senior year like they didn't expect. I just pray that you would bring them peace you would give them the strength to finish strong and be with each and every person in our schools and in all of our businesses, Lord, all of those who uh, go to work each and every day, see people each and every day. We pray that you would protect all of them. We come this morning, Lord, lifting up our prayers for those who need your healing. We pray for Paul's mother, Annette, as she recovers from a stroke. 
She battles anxiety. Lord, we pray for her healing and her peace. We pray for Carrie Bucant as she continues to battle a stomach bug, Lord. We pray for her healing. We pray for Elena in her battle with migraines. For Fawn's daughter, Brianna. We pray for Judy and Dick, uh, Dick Bird's daughter, Linda. Pray for continued healing for Julie Thorns. For Nancy Kajensrud as she reco- continues to recover from surgery. We pray for Avery and the whole Smith family. Pray for Vicki Cron's daughter-in-law. For Vicki Epperson. For Margie Goldsby. Fawn Glover. We lift up to you, Chris Pruce. We pray for those battling cancer, Lord. For Lindsay Gar- Garcia, Brenda Brown. For Ellen Roloffs. Lord, for all those who are battling illness, we pray for your hand of healing upon them. Bring restoration where it seems impossible. But Lord, in all these circumstances, we pray for peace and we pray for faith. We pray, Lord, that you would give them the strength to face what comes. And Lord, if it's your will, will to heal them, we give thanks. Lord, if their healing is eternal healing at home with you, we pray, Lord, for their peace. Be with all of us, Lord, as we gather together and worship today. We love you, Lord, and we celebrate you. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, I announce the offering. The offerings that we take go to support the ministries of Christ's community. Uh, By now, you've heard me say it. You know it. It's up on the screen. Four ways to give. But as we take this moment to focus on giving back to God, I'd invite you just to take a few minutes to reflect on how God has blessed you in your life, how he's calling you to give back out of the blessings that he's poured out on you. As the worship team teaches us another new song this week, I'm excited for this one as well. So much great worship music out there. We are so thankful, Lord, for their leadership as they continue to lead us with these. So take a few moments, familiarize yourself with the song. If you don't know it, it's all right. If you do, if you've heard it on the radio, sing along. But take a few moments to reflect on God's blessings. Through the valley, let your love rise above every fear, like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness. Your glory appears.
this is the plea of our hearts, right? I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I never will be enough. And the minute that I think that I'm enough, I'm lying to myself. I'm deluding myself. I'm putting confidence in my own abilities. I'm not enough unless Jesus is part of my life. So we give thanks that Jesus continues to move in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. His presence is here. But also when we gather together in this place, when we take moments to pursue him, to focus on him, Jesus is there as well in great abundance. That all we have to do is look for him. In fact, that's what's going on this week in our discussion. As we've been talking about, we started last week, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And he's running around, you know, Jerusalem, being Jesus, you know, he's appearing, he's disappearing, surprising people. And the whole goal is to convince his followers of his bodily resurrection. That this isn't something that shouldn't be surprising. They've been talking about it, and yet they needed some convincing. It's something that's hard, I think, to wrap the mind around. For us, Jesus, who is dead, is now alive. We look with the eyes of faith. For 2,000 years of history and church doctrine, it's built around the resurrection. We understand it, at least to a degree. We accept the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, physically, bodily, that he ascended into heaven, physically, bodily, this divine union of man and God. But for Jesus' followers in the first century, it was a a shock, to say the least. It was confusing to them. It also finally began to bring home everything Jesus had been talking about for three years. Over and over, as as he sat with them, as he taught them. Throughout the Gospels, we have these references. Jesus again and again hints at what was coming. His teachings pointed towards the cross. His talks about the kingdom of heaven pointed towards the cross. All of the law and the prophets, the poetic writings of the Old Testament, they all pointed to the cross. And in this moment, it begins to become real. Talked about his need for his death. And yet, it had caught the disciples by surprise. Following his resurrection, Jesus doesn't ascend into heaven immediately. He has a more important task. He has to let people know that he's for real. He has to let people know that he is risen. All right, just checking. So that sets up a whole bunch of appearances at the end of the Gospels. There's a whole bunch of them, especially some big ones, some big teaching moments in the Gospels of Luke and John, and that's what we're looking at in this time between the resurrection and his ascension. Or kicked it off last week with a great talk about doubts. Right, specifically about doubting God. This is something we all do on occasion, I think. We have doubts. Life is messy. We wonder if God is there. It's natural and it's, moment, and it's, and it's, it's normal. But what's important is that we don't allow the doubt to lead to unbelief. We don't allow the doubts to drive us away from God. But instead, we use this, these doubts to drive us in pursuit of God. To seek him out. To go, I wonder if he's there. You know what? I'm going to go find out. I'm not going to get mad and I'm not going to walk away. I'm going to go figure it out. If you didn't catch his message last week, I encourage you to jump on ccridgefield.com or on the church app. You pull that out, look at past messages, and check it out. Thomas had big doubts. He wasn't about to believe his friends who said Jesus was alive. He wanted to see it with his own eyes. He wanted to touch with his own hands. And Jesus obliged to give Thomas the more that he needed. And this had a purpose. Jesus challenges Thomas. He challenges this disbelief, this lack of faith that led him to demand this physical connection. But Jesus used that moment, this, this, this opportunity for first-hand testimony to the physical resurrection. He needed everyone to know it was him. That it wasn't just a spirit, that he had 
a physical body. If we're to have life after death, to one day rise with our physical bodies, finally, fully, and completely the perfect people that God intends for us to be, Jesus had to rise physically from the grave. Your hope of resurrection and mine rests entirely on his physical resurrection. And Jesus obliges him, lets him give this firsthand testimony. But he also gives a warning, right? Seeing and touching actually is an indication of a lack of faith. Believing what we can't put our hands on, that is faith. That's where we are now, right? Any of you ever seen Jesus? In the flesh? Yeah, me either. In fact, uh, I loved it last week, Orly said, uh, I can't remember exactly what you said, but you said something about Jesus popping up next to you, and you said your, your response would be what, uh, you take over? I don't even think I would have a response because I'm not sure I would recognize it's him because I'm not looking for him in the flesh. That's where we're at this morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, you want to open to Luke chapter 24. We're going to be in verse 13. You also pull out your phone, go to the church app. There's a Bible on there or just tap Sunday morning. You'll find the scripture verses. Luke chapter 24. We're looking at another appearance of Jesus. And this is one uh, with another group of followers. It's not the disciples of his inner circle. These two men, they're not part of the 11, um, but they are referred to as others. People who were listed as Jesus' disciples, but they were kind of like the next ring of followers. People who didn't travel with him each and every day. People who weren't right in his center section, but, uh, but they were still around at many, op- many times when Jesus talked. And they're walking from Jerusalem to the town of Emmaus, and they have an encounter along this lonely road. And you may have read this story before, but in Luke chapter 24, it goes, uh, it goes like this. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that had happened here in these days? What things, Jesus asks. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It takes a moment there to do like an entire set of teaching. You know, pulls out all the prophecies about himself and lays them all out for them. Oh, well, they don't have a clue who he is. Some guy on the road. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if, to go, as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, where there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. That's a big passage. There's a lot in there, and we could actually spend a couple of weeks talking about everything that happens. Today, though, I want to talk about the very beginning of this passage, this encounter on the road. Because, see, in this encounter with Jesus, these two men are caught completely by surprise. Because often Jesus appears when we least expect it. 
This is what he does. Oftentimes when we least expect it, he shows up. Look again at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up, walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. So these two guys, they're probably headed back home after the Passover. It's a pretty dramatic Passover. I mean, I'm sure all the other years kind of paled by comparison. And they're talking about everything that was going on because who wouldn't be? Right? If you and I were there and we were walking back home afterwards, what do you think our topic of conversation would be? Aside from the fact that the Sounders beat Minnesota yesterday, we'd be talking about Jesus and the Passover. So there's two topics. Okay? Now, there's some question about the location of Emmaus. You know, if you've ever wondered where it is, it's generally assumed to be just north of Jerusalem. In fact, I have a map here. Um, and you can t- just take a quick look. You see him circle. Jerusalem's right there. Emmaus, just a few miles to the north. So really not that far. Uh, now, if this was home for the two men, it's likely they had experienced Jesus on a number of occasions. They were, after all, labeled as his disciples, as he has come through the region, as he has taught, that they would have sat under his teaching. They would have been present for a lot of what he talked about. And they would have been in Jerusalem for the Passover because it's only about a half a day's walk to get back home again. And as they're headed away from Jerusalem, they're walking along the road and are in no way expecting to encounter Jesus. And Jesus shows up. Now, I don't think it's so much because Jesus likes to make an entrance. You know? He likes to surprise people, say, hey, here I am. You know, caught you by surprise. Right? Caught you looking the other way. Now, I mean, this is what unwanted house guests do. They show up on your doorstep without calling so that you can't turn them away. Okay? I think the reason Jesus shows up so often when we aren't expecting it is because we aren't looking for it. These two men on the road, they knew that there was no way they were going to encounter Jesus. They they knew that he was gone. That, That... I mean, it's made up their conversation, right? In fact, the Jesus, Jesus is what they're talking about. In verse, uh, in verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We'd hoped he was going to be the one to redeem Israel, but he's dead. There's some excuse for these two men not to be expecting Jesus. They were disciples, but whether they were new to the group or just people who were on the outer fringes, like so many, they misunderstood what Jesus was about. They thought he was going to be a military conqueror. They thought he was going to come in like they would have been the ones in the crowd on Palm Sunday, waving the palm fronds, shouting Hosanna, expecting him to wipe away the Roman legions and restore Israel to its place of power, the one that God had promised. When he went to the cross, they were left feeling disappointed. They certainly weren't expecting a resurrection to occur. And then Jesus to walk up to them on the road. They're clearly confused about the empty tomb. The text said they were kept from recognizing him. But again, I have to to wonder if they would have even known who it was if he hadn't been incognito. I mean, if he'd walked up next to them and they knew he was dead in the tomb, just like me, I don't think they would have known who it was. But while these men have some excuse knowing that Jesus went to the cross, what excuse do we have? What excuse do we have? Well, it's very unlikely that Jesus will show up in the flesh today. Okay. I was was a little nervous about saying that. Well, it's very unlikely, though, that he'll show up in the flesh. We know that he didn't end on the cross. We know that he rose from the dead. We believe in his victory over the grave. We proclaim... His eventual return. We said it in the creed this morning, right? That's all of that in in the Apostles' Creed. Believe in Jesus who lived, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, who descended to the dead, who rose again on the third day, ascended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and will what? Come once again to judge the living and the dead. We proclaim all this. Why then are we continually looking the other way when Jesus shows up? And while he doesn't do it in the flesh, he does it in so many other ways. In the kindness of a stranger. 
or in the love of a child or in the beauty of a spring morning. We see God's presence in his creation, in peace during trouble, through the Holy Spirit within us. Jesus is wherever we are, not just in big miraculous ways, but in simple quiet ones. Constantly reassuring us that we are not alone. And if we aren't watching for him, we're going to miss him. There's another great story Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, he tells this parable. And he says, at at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like. And those are the moments when Jesus tells a parable. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven that is coming, but is also here now. He says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars with, along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. We brought the flashlights, but we forgot to bring spare batteries. Right? No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. Run down to 7-Eleven, pick up some more batteries, come on back. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other ones came also, and they pounded on the door. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. This is the the line. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is like the Aesop fable with the moral at the end of the story, right? In the final line, you don't know when Jesus is going to show up next, so be ready. Keep watch. Don't get so wrapped up in your daily life that you forget to make him part of it. We can get so focused on kids or on grandkids or work or caring for loved ones or keeping the yard mowed. I have a teenager for that, by the way. And all the other stuff that makes up our days that we can forget to keep our eyes out for Jesus. The warning of Matthew 25, it's also a major song in The Lion King, be prepared. All right, any of you who have grandkids, you're singing the song in your head right now, right? Be prepared. Jesus doesn't also doesn't just show up when we aren't expecting him. Not only does he show up when we're not expecting him, he also teaches us how to listen. Check it out. I love how Jesus handles his interaction with these two guys. He obviously has an agenda. He approaches them on a lonely road to keep knowledge of himself hidden. And this speaks to a plan. It isn't a random encounter. Jesus is moving beyond simple interaction with two random people that he runs into on a road. His goal is to emphasize his resurrection. And what that means, and we see this goal become evident in his discussion with them, uh, but it's how he starts the discussion that captures our attention. He could have come in in his full resurrection glory, right? You know, body glowing with divine declaration, face visible, voice commanding as it booms out over the landscape. But he doesn't. Instead, he approaches incognito and he just asks a question. What are you guys talking about? What are you guys talking about? And then he listens to their response. As people, we aren't often good at listening. I think our public discourse is good evidence of this. We are more interested in responding than in hearing. How well do we actually hear what someone is saying when they talk? Discussion, debate, argument. We want to win. How many of us can honestly say that we take time to walk in someone else's shoes and we do that By listening. We all would agree, I think, in here, that bringing an end to a pregnancy is a bad thing. Right? It's a terrible thing, the death of a child. But in our zeal to prevent it from occurring, do we stop listening to the stories of those who are so desperate 
that they've been driven to make this awful choice. I just, this to me is one of the best examples of listening that I can think of. Do we listen to the single mother who doesn't know how she can care for or feed an infant when she has no home? Do we listen to the teenage girl who's desperately afraid that her parents will kick her out if they find out? Do we listen to the waitress who was raped as she walked to her car after her shift? And every moment reminds her of the violence and violations she endured. Are we listening? This is a challenge for us to take time to step back from our own opinions, our own feelings, and at least try to listen to somebody else because it's going to change how we feel about them. It may not change my opinion of the actual event, but it's going to change how I understand them. It gives me compassion. It lets them know that I hear them. When we're so busy formulating our response, people feel like we're not listened to. What Jesus does is he gets out, he asks a question, and he listens. Now, this is an extreme example, the one very prevalent in our society. But are we listening in the little things, too? Are we asking our children or our grandchildren how their day has gone and actually listened? I find I do this a lot. How was your day? Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. I wasn't really listening, was I? I mean, I heard the words, but I didn't understand it from their point of view. Raising teenagers, this is one of the areas I'm realizing i got to pay more attention to. Listening to entering into their life. What are they feeling? Listening to our spouses, caring about them as people. This is what Jesus is doing. He's engaging these men, not as the Son of God to puny humans, but is one person willing to take the time to engage and care about and listen to another. Now, Jesus does end up calling them foolish, but it isn't because he wants to win the discussion. Jesus, unlike us, is always right. Okay? I am sure that I am always right, but I'm mostly wrong. I've learned this in my life. It doesn't stop me from thinking I'm right, but... Jesus is always right. His statement's a wake-up call to the foolish. But it isn't because he doesn't care about the person. Instead, it's because he cares completely about the person. In James chapter 1, verse 19, James writes, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be what? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But quick to hear and slow to speak. What comes between quick to hear and slow to speak? Listening. Taking time to understand None of this happens by accident. It doesn't happen because Jesus is sitting in a garden or a tomb or a church waiting for people to come along either. He's not sitting there waiting for people to pay attention to him. In fact, when he rose, Jesus didn't wait to be discovered. When the women go to the tomb, what do they find? They don't find Jesus. Right? They find it's empty. He was out looking for people. Jesus was being the church. And his time with the men on the road to Emmaus shows us how to be the church too. So he shows up when we're least expecting it. He teaches us how to listen. And then he shows us that we got to go to the road. we got to go to the road. For the long time, the church has been caught in a come-to-us-and-see sort of approach. We've talked about this in here before. We wait for people to come through the doors to us. We put out signs and wait for the crowds to show up. Hope available within. Inquire at the desk. Right? All the while ignoring the fact the church is in rapid decline. In large part because we're waiting in the tomb rather than going to the road. So today I have a challenge for everyone who's hearing this. I have a challenge. COVID's put us on our heels. We've been existing on a come-to-us setting for more than a year. And it's going to continue for a little while longer as we wait for more opportunities. But... It will not be forever. And so today, I issue a challenge to everyone who is here. When the world opens back up again, I challenge Christ's community to go to the road. We came to Ridgefield to be a church that's active in our community, and we started that way. But by the time COVID came around, we... Before COVID hit, we were actually less active than we had been in our first two years after the move. And today I say, no more. We're going to sit in the tomb waiting for people to come to us. 
I'm calling everyone here, everyone who watches this message, everyone who's part of Christ's community to join me. I can't do this alone. Elena and I can't do this alone. We're a family together. We are the body of Christ here in this place. We need ideas. We need plans. We need a congregation willing to take the church outside the walls of the school to be our presence, to be Christ's presence in the community. Jesus didn't wait in the tomb. He went and he found people wherever they were, not just after his death, but before it as well. He was always out where the people were. He was always on the move. In fact, he couldn't get away from them half the time. Everywhere he went, crowds followed. He was on the road. And today, the challenge before us is, are we going to go to the road as well? Are we going to be the presence of Christ. This is the job that he left to us. Jesus left the earth and he placed his presence within us so we could be his hands and his feet. Hands and feet aren't meant to be laying in a recliner, kicked up. They're meant to be on the road. So my question for you today, are you ready to be the presence of Christ here where we are? Are you willing to go to the road, to join me as we get ready to step out because when, when we get to the point where restrictions go away and we can move back out into the world more fully and completely as there are places where people are, I want to be ready. The day is coming soon. So that's the challenge that we have. I told her earlier I was writing this and it was scaring the living daylights out of me because I've realized if I say it, I'm going to have to do it. And I realize as I'm writing it that I'm going to have to say it. And everything within me wanted to stop and take a different approach. It's like we could talk about going to the road and talk about it in more of an academic sense. But the truth of the matter is the church is meant to be mobile. The church is meant to be active and present. Can we do it? Can we? Can we be the presence of Christ in our community? It's not just me. It's not just Elena. I'm going to have to start, I'm going to start bugging everybody. We're going to talk about this a lot more. We're going to the road. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the road. We're going to show up where people least expect it. We're going to learn how to listen. We're going to be where they are. Okay? He's risen? Oh, that had a lot less enthusiasm to it. <laughs> You're also wishing I hadn't said that, right? All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I, just, I give thanks for what you call us to do. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you call us out of our comfort, that you set us onto a road that can be terrifying. But I pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength and the courage to be the people that you've called us to be. You call us to be Christ community the presence of Christ in our community. You have called us with, the, with a mission to go out and meet people, serve them where they are. So help us to do that, Lord. Fill us with your presence as we go out today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anybody remember our purpose statement? What we do? Do you remember what it is? You know, it's boiled down to three words, but it's actually... Uh, Six words. What is it? No Christ, no love, Christ, show love, grow followers. Now, let me point out that the knowing Christ is only one-third of that whole thing. There's also the show love part and the grow followers part, both of which require going to the road. This is who we are. This is how we defined ourselves. This is how we created ourselves to be. Those of you who've been around a long time, some of you here had a hand in crafting that statement. You remember it back then. It's still true, right? Still true. No Christ. Show love. Grow followers. We've got to go to the road. That, I would invite you to, I'll invite you to stand just a minute. Mike has a, has a plea. Just a couple of things. Uh, first, again, you know, we're so blessed to have this worship team. Uh, that was uh, a, another a, a great new song. Okay. And thank you, Alan, for showing up. That extra guitar is really cool. Um, just to let you know, we do have a couple of board positions open. So if you feel inclined, you know, if you hear the call, let me or uh, Eli know. 
you know, I'd sure like to talk to you about it. Um, it's it's um, it's not it, it's a lot of it's actually a lot of fun, and it's very rewarding. And uh, you know, um, Eli and Elena need the help. So if you feel inclined, let me know. Okay. And again, thanks you guys. I really appreciate it. With that, I would invite you to stand. Let's share the blessing as we get ready to go out this morning. It's a whole new day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Oh.